fear typically comes from, well, ignorance. And wh what I mean is, is, is how a, a lack of knowledge and understanding, not really understanding, not having all of the facts, makes your fears worse. It exacerbates the fears. The, the, I like to think of it this way. In the absence of facts, we often substitute our worst fears as truth. What is happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, your weekly dose of all things production and library music. So whether you're simply curious about the sync industry or wanting to write better cues or ready to pitch to publishers, I promise you, you're in the right place. My name is Dave Croft, and it is so good to be with you today. And if you find this video helpful, then why don't you give it a thumbs up here on YouTube or a five-star review in your podcast app. And be sure to subscribe because I talk about library music every single week. Today's episode wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of our member subscribers at 52Qs who not only keep the community alive and thriving, but as members, they get access to extra features like workshops, live streams, office hours, Q breakdowns, Zoom feedback sessions, hundreds of hours of video archives, and opportunities to submit to real music library. So uh, if you're ready to get started and make a serious push into your career in production music, then why don't you head over to 52Qs.com. It's free to join and memberships start at around four bucks a month. So it is week five here in 52 Qs and uh, 2024. And how's my week going? It's going really, really well. I just put the finishing touches on my final Q for my cinematic world or modern world album. And we're going to listen to that last cue. It's called Gin and Tonic. That's a title that I have to give propers to Les Fuller. Uh, during the live stream last Friday, we were brainstorming titles. And, uh, you know, I love, I love a good pun. And so he came up with the title Gin and Tonic. That is for my Expedition 52 submission. And we're going to be listening to that here in just a second. But Man, it's always really good to to finish a project, especially one that's been, I don't know, kind of kicking around my to-do list for quite a while. And so um, it always feels really good. Of course, I had to go do the deliverables, do the stems and cut downs, alt mixes, minus mixes, and the metadata and all of that. So, I mean, that's, that's not as fun. But uh, it's, it feels really good to have it out the door. And now I can put attention to several of the other projects I've got going on over the next uh, over the next little while. And you will be hearing some of those cues. I'm starting to work up uh, music for a golf documentary for the Masters Tournament. Every year, Augusta National puts out, uh, or puts out a documentary for the Masters Tournament. And uh, this will be my fifth year doing or helping out with the music. It's bespoke. It's production music, but it's not underscore. It's not scored, rather. And uh, so you will see those cues start to show up. Now, as far as my Expedition 52 submission for week five, uh, I wrote a cue called Gin and Tonic, as in D-J-I-N-N, -N, which is you know another word for genie. And I, I love that title. And again, Les, thank you so much for letting me have that title. I said, are you sure? This is a fantastic title. And he's like, yes, it's yours. So, I, and I promised him, I'm going to give you your propers on the podcast. So Les, tip of my hat. Thank you so much for letting me have a stellar, stellar title. So uh, we're going to take a listen to Gin and Tonic. It is a moody, ominous, Middle Eastern flavored tension cue. And so uh, we're going to take a listen to that.
that was Gin and Tonic, my week five Expedition 52 submission. And uh, friends and family can see a complete breakdown of this queue later in the week. So today's topic is what are you afraid of? What are the fears that you have regarding a career in production music? Or really, I mean, really any creative outlet, whether it's film scoring, writing game music, being a painter or whatever. What keeps you up at night? What are the things that keep you from success maybe? And so I wanna unpack five or six different fears that you might be struggling with or that, that I know that I've struggled with and maybe give you some tips on how to overcome those fears. But before we, we talk about the fears, I, I wanna say that in general, in my experience, fear typically comes from, well, ignorance. And what I mean is, is, is how a, a lack of knowledge and understanding, not really understand, not having all of the facts makes your fears worse. It exacerbates the fears. The, the, I like to think of it this way. In the absence of facts, we often substitute our worst fears as truth. And if you've ever had a beef with somebody, or if you've maybe gone to a meeting or something and you come away thinking, uh, oh, that, 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 that person didn't say this, or you text somebody and they don't text back and, and, and you're like, oh man, they must be really, really mad at me because you don't know all the facts, your, your own fears start to create the truth in your mind. And so I just want to say on, on, the, on the topic, whether it's learning how to mix, whether it's networking, whether it's overcoming your fear of putting yourself out there, write, submit, forget, repeat, and financial stuff, sustainability, we're going to talk about all of that today. But I just want to say that most fears come from lack of understanding. And we overcome that by educating ourselves, staying informed, uh, seeking advice, mentorship, filling, filling the knowledge gaps, okay? Finding out the facts before you let yourself go to that fear-based place. So I want to talk. I want to talk five or, or six fears that I think are, are the kind of the most important fears that I've run into and give you some suggestions on how to overcome those. First, the fear of financial instability. How, how are you going to make money doing this? How, how are you going to have sufficient income to support yourself? Just yesterday, I was in uh, one of the uh, PMA virtual networking uh, groups that they put on and shout out to Morgan and everybody over there at the PMA. They do amazing work. And it was a virtual networking event. And so we get into a breakout room and I'm in there with like five or six other people. And uh, one person jumps in and the first question before introductions or anything, they're like, okay, who here has made, you know, a full-time living or what kind of money do you make doing this? And that was in my opinion, that was a reaction of some of this, the fear, like how much money can you really make? How, how can you really support yourself or support your family? And if you don't know, and with the lack of facts, then you substitute, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not going to make it. And, and I have had some sleepless nights not really knowing if we're going to be able to cover mortgage. I've had some, some, some moments where I feel like I'm pumping cues out and not seeing a return investment. And that's, that's a really tough place to be in, especially early in your career where you're in the first three, four years and you, you've pumped out a lot of cues, but you're not seeing a lot of royalties. Yeah, that just feeds into the fear. So how do you overcome that fear? Well, some of it is, is having patience. Some of it is also diversifying your income streams, not putting all of your eggs into one basket. And I don't mean just production music. I mean, I teach and I do production music and I run the community and all of those kind of things. There's that kind of diversity, but there's also diversifying your library portfolio. This is why I encourage students and, or, or anybody I mentor or coach 
not to depend solely on one library or one service, like Taxi. If your entire portfolio strategy consists of pumping queues into the, the taxi ecosystem, then that is the only metric you have afforded yourself for success or failure. And that failure absolutely feeds into that fear. So have taxi as a strategy wholeheartedly. I believe in taxi. I've gotten library deals through taxi. I've talked plenty about taxi on this channel, but where we get into trouble, in my opinion, is where it is the only way that we are pursuing our career. So diversify. And yes, that means sometimes you might need to pitch your music to a library unsolicited and We'll talk about that and overcoming, you know, the fears of, of networking and, and, and putting yourself out there. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But diversifying where you are pitching and diversifying your income streams. That might mean while you're ramping up this career that you have a day job. That may or may not be music related. I feel super fortunate that I have a day job. I teach full time at Full Sail, and I just took on another role as uh, one of the department chairs in the music program at Full Sail. And I am the department chair of the industry and portfolio department for the music production degree at Full Sail University. I do. I took on that role because I believe in helping connect students with careers. It's it's all the same thing. It's what I'm doing here on this YouTube channel, not necessarily related to full sale. It's what I do in the 52 Q's community. It's, it's all cut from the same cloth, but it's not necessarily making music. I'm not making music full time. I'm diversifying my portfolio. It might mean that you gig just this morning. During one of our masterminds, we have one of the participants who lives in Australia, and he's a gigging musician. That's what he does. He gigs, songwriter, but also pushing into production music. So diversification really helps offset that fear, because if one, one stream of income dries up or atrophies or maybe has some down like some downturns, then you're not completely stuck. Or if you have a library and, and all of your cues are with one library and it, it might be going really well for you for quite a while, but what happens if that library has a, a down month? Or what happens if that library's biggest client decides to go a different direction? Because you've hitched your wagon to that one library, now you're in trouble and that creates instability. So diversifying your income stream, also uh, financial planning, budgeting, seeking, uh, seeking out the help of others. And this is something that, you know, here it's tax season and I am learning, oh my gosh, Dave, you, you should have LLC'd like three or four years ago instead of just last year. Yeah, I was running as a sole proprietor and uh, I'm getting crushed, 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 or, or I did get crushed on taxes. And that led to insecurity, financial instability, and it fed into those fears. And a lot of it was ignorance. Not knowing all of the facts. And there was just this kind of low-grade rumbling fear, like in the base of my consciousness that, oh man, this is going to be really, really bad. Then I procrastinate and put off doing my taxes to the last minute. And then suddenly the sword of Damocles swings and man getting hosed on taxes. And so I'm learning that the hard way, but getting financial planning, budgeting, for every dollar that comes in, whether through royalties, through the community or whatever, that I'm having to 1099 for, then I've got to set aside money for taxes. It's really easy when you get a royalty check and you're like, hey, this is great. I, I can buy that plug in now or I can buy a new banjo for the wall or something like that. So that's how I am getting over the fear of financial instability. So that's the first fear. 
financial instability. The second fear that I've experienced is sustainability. Can I sustain a level of output, a level of creativity? Can I keep up with the demands of all of the diverse income streams that I've got coming in? That's a real fear. And that sustainability comes in different flavors. It comes in uh, being able to just physically have the hours in the day to do the work. It comes in, can I sustainably create something? What about writer's block? What about uh, uh, mixing consistently? And I have found that overcoming the fear of sustainability uh, comes through repetition, doing the reps. Yes, adapting to, to industry changes. Yes, um, always learning and, and, and diversifying your, your skill set. But you, you create sustainability by doing the reps, doing the repetition. I talk um, to my, my students often about my mixing method, which is basically mixing the track three different times. And it creates doing the repetition. Having a skill set, having a skill set that um, that you can lean on should something dry up over here, like uh, in your in your creative output. Learning how to reference, learning how to listen to something, immediately get a little spark of inspiration, and then run with it. That can help your sustainability, as well as if we're looking having a sustainable career, uh, career planning, setting goals for yourself, setting. Uh, obtainable goals for yourself. And for many of us, it's one Q a week. I mean, that's, that's why it's 52, the number 52, 52 weeks in a year, one Q a week. It's what Expedition 52 is about, creating one Q a week. And that's very doable for most folks. And even if one Q isn't, maybe one Q every two weeks, set a goal and hit it and do everything within your power without sacrificing health, uh, whether physical health, mental health, or your relationships or whatever. Don't sacrifice those things. In my opinion, I don't think it's worth it. But um, having goals, planning your career, it kind of goes along with financial stability, you know, having people in place that can help you achieve what you're looking to achieve. So that is the fear of non-sustainability. Overcome that by doing the repetitions, doing the work, even if it's bad, even if it's not great. It's better to have written something bad than not to have written. Absolutely. Okay, so another fear. Fear number three. Relevance and originality. How can we stay relevant in such a competitive industry, how can we stay original? How can we make sure that what we're doing is saying new things, especially with uh, oncoming AI and all of that? And that's that's a fear that is uh, that is quickly uh, becoming more and more real. And we'll talk about that. But how can you stay relevant? How can you make sure that the cues you're writing are wanted and they're on demand and somebody wants to put them on TV? Well. We overcome that fear by learning, by continuously listening, continuously uh, referencing, continuously trying to, to put our ear to the ground, listen to what's new, being open, surrounding yourself by people who are pushing you. This is why communities are such a good thing, whether it's 52 Qs or whether it's the PMA or whatever, but surround yourself with people who are doing the thing you want to do and are doing it now. So continual learning, development, mentoring, input, feedback, all of that, that helps keep you relevant and helps overcome the fear of unoriginality. Also, experimentation, giving yourself enough time to play around in the DAW, play around with some ideas. Can you come up with innovation? Can you listen to something and think, oh man, I've, I've never heard that today. And how can I incorporate something like that in my own queue? Yeah, knowing where the industry is going, 
knowing what the trends are, knowing what's changing in the, in the production music space, just like in the 10 years that I've really been pushing it, I mean, some of the rules are changing, whether they're rules about using loops and samples, whether it's the rules about um, copyrights and PROs and splits and sync licenses, or whether it's just, this is what sells and this is what doesn't sell. Yeah, for you trailer folks out there, Man, trailer trends seem to change on a dime and then something new will happen Then everyone will glob onto it and it'll be super popular and then something else will, will change. And before you know it, you have a catalog of irrelevant music that isn't getting placed anymore. So that can be a real fear. Next, another fear. The fear of failure. The fear of just not making it. The fear of putting yourself out there and getting rejected. The fear of making mistakes, of, of failing, of somebody saying your music is not valuable enough to put on television, not good enough, not relevant. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big one. And so often... The fear of failure will keep us from even trying. We don't want to put ourselves, you can't fail if you don't try, right? So the fear of failure, how, how you overcome that? Well, by putting yourself out there and embracing the fact that often failure is the best teacher. Like, have you ever heard the uh, the phrase, I think it's called like failing upwards, right? And basically that means, in, in, in as far as I, I'm concerned, somebody succeeds but doesn't really know how they succeeded. They don't know how they got there. They just fumbled their way into success. And that's not sustainable. See also fear of uh, non-sustainability. But... We can often learn so much more from trying something and failing than by succeeding and not knowing why we succeeded, but knowing why we failed. So just embracing that, it's going to happen, especially early in your career, but even later in your career. This is where uh, an ecosystem like Taxi, I think it really helps with that. You know, the returns, the not, not hearing back, the um, uh, the forwards and even placements in libraries, but maybe things aren't getting on television, right? Those are all little moments of failure, which is really harsh. And I don't mean it's super harsh. You kind of kind of get where I'm coming from, but embracing that as a learning opportunity, which takes resilience and having a positive mindset, because uh, risk taking, if you, if you put yourself out there, you are making yourself vulnerable, but you, and you, and you balance that with strategic planning and making sure that, um, <laughs> that you're relevant and original and you've done all of those things, but even still, it might not, you might not get it. I mean, Jim Carrey didn't, didn't make it on SNL. He auditioned and they turned him down. Jim Carrey got turned down for Saturday Night Live, which boggles my mind. But if arguably one of the most successful comedians over the last 30 years fails at arguably one of the most high profile properties in sketch comedy, then I think me failing at a dr plucky dramedy cue for uh, an episode of House Hunters, yeah, suddenly my failure <laughs> doesn't seem quite as bad. You balance that risk-taking with planning, let the planning and the, the referencing, sustainability, stability in your fine, let your planning do as much as it can, but when you put yourself out there, out there that's when you release it, you let it go and, well, you submit and you forget and you repeat. Next, the fear of networking. Yep, 
for you introverts out there, this can be a real, a real thing. Putting yourself out there, not your music, but putting yourself physically out there in front of other people, building and maintaining those industry connections, which means sometimes you, you do have to engage with other people you don't know. A relationship is still one of the highest forms of currency in this business because you're working with other people. You might have to go to a conference. And if you do, it's okay to, to have your container space. You know, I, I talked last year, or I guess it was 2022, when I went to the Taxi Road Valley, it was just, there were so many people that I had to go up to the hotel room and just create separation. It was just too much. Shannon and I call that container space to recharge. And I'm a pretty extroverted guy, but it's going to take a little bit of that. Networking, community engagement, putting yourself out there, trying to, to, to collaborate and have relationships with people. Often, outside of exchanging emails. Now, in order to get better at this, doing it in safe environments, whether it's through a mentoring, uh, mentoring program, a professional community, or, or uh, professional development opportunities, whatever. This is where I think the PMA does a great job. I said just yesterday we had a, a PMA virtual networking event, and it was fantastic. I love those things. I, one of my favorite things that we do just hanging out in a Zoom room with a couple of strangers, swapping LinkedIn profiles, just getting to know them. And then next time, during the next event, oh yeah, I remember you, we were in a Zoom room together. And then when I go to the PMC in LA in September, hey, yeah, I, re- I know you, let's go grab a coffee. And that's, that's how a relationship gets done. It's not necessarily... Walking up to a stranger, hi, I'm Dave, I write music, here's my card. No, it's much more fluid and natural than that. And doing it in, I hate to use this term because it gets used pejoratively, but uh, in safe places, right? Like the PMA or like 52Qs. The 52Qs community is all about supportive, encouraging environment. Putting yourself out there creating connections. Maybe you find somebody that you can write with or, or whatever. But seeking those opportunities in an environment that you feel comfortable and safe in and taking a chance, taking a little bit of a risk. When you need your container time, go take your container time, but don't use container time as an excuse not to network, not to connect. And I think you'll get there. I think you'll get there. And finally, the last fear that I have seen over and over, I see it almost every single week on like the Facebook groups, you know, whether it's the perspective Facebook group or the trailer writing or whatever, everybody is talking about AI. And I got to say the fear of AI or obsolete, uh, obsolescence through technology is nothing new. It's nothing new at all. It's one of the reasons John Philip Sousa hated the player piano. It's going to take jobs. It's one of the reasons there was resistance against jukeboxes because it's going to replace live musicians. And navigating the landscape of AI with new technologies is just part of the gig. AI is just the the, the latest avatar for all those things which are going to come and take our jobs. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I am confident that AI isn't going to replace humans. And the reason I'm confident is I stay informed about these types of advancements. I, I, I am a member of the OpenAI subreddit, the ChatGPT subreddit. I use ChatGPT all the time. My show notes for this very podcast was helped and organized with the help of ChatGPT. I pump some ideas in, it categorizes it for me puts it all in a little bullet list. We use ChatGPT as not a, a tool, or let me say it another way. We use ChatGPT not to replace our work, but to enhance our work. 
I can't just wholesale copy and paste it and call it a day. Nope, that's that's like composing using a bunch of splice loops and calling that like, hey, all I did was I took this melody and I took this drum beat and and call it original. Is it something? Yes, but you're not going to make a career out of it. You're not going to make a career out of just wholesale copying and pasting chat GPT. Likewise, I don't think any... I feel I feel I'm feeling frothy and ranty, but I don't think any production who uses AI generated music A was going to pay anybody really anyway, and B if you did get paid, it's going to be pennies in royalties. Now, AI, like with all technology, usually replaces the most replaceable. And what I mean in the production music space is that lowest hanging fruit, the lowest effort. If you can bang out a a, a complete cue in half an hour or an hour, then chances are AI is going to be able to do that. I'm sorry to say. No, I'm not. I'm not here to say that. It ha- you have to take a long time to write cues, or if you're really fast, I'm not denigrating that. But there is a process to creativity that I think just takes the human spirit a little bit of time. And as fast as I am, my fastest cues probably take about three to four hours. Could probably whittle that down to two and a half hours if I was really, really pushing. But just slapping some things together, um, I don't know. I may have may have may have <laughs> made some people angry saying that, but I don't know. That that for me feels like the the lowest hanging fruit, and AI is probably going to eat you up. But the reality is, is that low hanging fruit probably wasn't making you a lot of money anyway, and probably wasn't making anybody a lot of money. And so companies who aren't putting a big value on music, yeah, they're, they're going to go to an AI generator. Even beyond that, I believe the people who are going to survive the AI apocalypse are the ones, not, not the ones who avoid AI, but the ones who leverage AI to make what they already do better and they are able to make it faster. And that's how we're using AI here at 52 Qs. So instead of spending two hours prepping show notes for a podcast episode, I could spend a half an hour. And that's an additional hour and a half that I get back in my day that I could pump into editing. You might notice there's more editing going on here. Yep. We even have an editor. Shout out to Leo. Leo is helping out with the interviews. We're doing camera switches right? We're doing edits, clean up, all of those kind of things. Yeah, hopefully it's it's pretty transparent, but we're able to, we, we using the tools have has given us more time that we can then apply to make what we already do better. And the, the, other, the other aspect of surviving the AI apocalypse comes from emphasizing the things that humans can do And that the robots can't replicate. And that is originality and uniqueness. Ingenuity. Outside the box thinking. Mashing up of styles. I'm not sure. AI, even the most sophisticated AI, isn't really intelligent, right? It's just, it's programming. It's algorithm. It's predictive text which is fascinating and amazing, but what it's not is creating something from nothing. And that's something that humans have in absolute abundance, which is why AI doesn't scare me. We have to up our game, folks. You know, earlier I said the rules are changing. Well, some of the rules are we have to up our game, our Productions have to be better. We have to improve the quality of our sounds. We have to record more instruments, something, record something. 
I don't think it's any great coincidence that we're seeing a rise of vocal music and vocal um, searches with libraries because that's what the robots can't do. Robots, you know what I mean. AI can't replicate a convincing human voice. It's getting darn close, but not there yet. There's still an uncanny valley. And as soon as as soon as a, a library or a client catches wind of, oh, there's AI going on in here, this, this vo vocal is AI, the humans will shut it down. Just the market will say, nope. Because I got to tell you, if I'm listening to an audiobook and I catch wind that it is an AI narrator, I will return it. I mean, I'm not going to listen to an AI read a book at me. <laughs> no. So... That fear of obsolescence, of, of technology replacing you, um, technological advancements, nope. Educate yourself. Be mindful of it. You cannot bury your head in the sand, but I don't think it's quite the, uh, the sky is falling situation that maybe some folks who are uh, maybe fishing for clicks on a YouTube video or on a blog article, um, maybe, maybe. Anyway, that's all I'll say about that. So the fear of financial instability, the fear of sustainability, the fear of relevance and, and becoming unoriginal, the fear of failure, the fear of networking and creating those relationships, and finally, the fear of obsolescence, becoming obsolete due to technology or AI. These are six of the biggest fears that I have experienced or I'm seeing in the community, but I'd love to hear from you. What, what do you think? What are some of the fears that you are experiencing or have experienced and have you overcome those fears? If you have, please let me know in the comments below. I do absolutely read all of those and I would absolutely love to hear from you. But uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Once again, a huge word of thanks to the family, friends, and neighbor of 52Qs who helped keep the community going. Please know that without you, none of this would be possible. These are folks who pay their actual real-life money to keep the community going. And if that sounds like something that you would like to do, help the, help the community, help the, the network and, and the channel and all of that, but also get all of those extra perks, then head over to 52Qs.com, like I said, subscription packages start at just four dollars a month you definitely want to tune in next week because we are joined by john audio who has an amazing youtube channel and he is the synth guru who's joining us to talk all about synthesis uh, creating your own synth pa patches the different synthesizers that he loves to use and a ton more and at the end of february he's going to be joining us in 52 q's community for the family and friends subscribers in holding a workshop and writing tension patches from scratch so you definitely want to tune in john audio joins us this week but i hope that you've had a stellar week five and i know that you're going to have an amazing week six how do i know that friends because i know trust and believe that the universe has amazing plans just for you until next time peace the 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2024 818 studios all rights reserved the music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only for more information including joining the community or becoming a member subscriber of 52 Q's head over to 52 Q's dot com.